In today's video, I'm gonna show you how I recreated this Dan Winters portrait and came up with this result. What's up everyone, Pete Coco here. Thanks as always for joining me. I'm a headshot portrait photographer from New York and today I wanna to talk to you about how I recreated this Dan Winters portrait of David Fahey. And if you don't know who Dan Winters is, you owe it to yourself to check out his work. He's one of the preeminent portrait photographers of our time. Uh, his work is beautiful and mysterious and has a ton of depth and a lot of shadow detail. Um, and he's one of my favorite photographers. But recently, my buddy, John Kiefer, who's also an awesome photographer and good friend of mine, came to the studio and we decided that we were gonna try our hand at replicating one of Dan's awesome portraits. Uh, so I just scrolled through his website and I found this particular shot, which I really liked, and we decided, all right, let's give it a go, see if we can recreate this. And John became the subject. So I did most of the adjusting while John patiently waited um, and was you know, photographed many, many times. Now, the first thing we did was to look at the catch lights in the image. So if you look closely at the image and you look at the catch lights in the eye, it looked to us at first like he was using sort of a mid-size mid um, octobox of some kind. Now I figured it couldn't be too large because if you look at the light, it's pretty much concentrated on his face. So the light is rather hard. It's not very soft and diffused, right? And there's a lot of shadows. Now, obviously, part of those shadows were, were created by using um, flags. But the first thing we did was we took a 28-inch deep parabolic softbox, and we said, let's try this and see what it looks like. So we experimented for quite a while. We experimented with two layers of diffusion, with uh, one layer of diffusion, just the internal diffusion, and also with a grid. Yet, no matter what we did, we couldn't really get the same look like the photo um, that was our inspiration. And let me say right here also that I have no idea what the actual lighting that Dan Winters used for his portrait was. So what I wanted to do is just use whatever I had in my studio here to try and replicate it. So we couldn't get it to, to look like what we wanted it to look like. We tried for quite a while moving the softbox around and flagging it and doing all these different things. But for our eyes, the light just looked too diffused. It didn't look focused enough on the face. So what we ended up doing to, to create a harder light was just using what I have here right behind me, which is um, an Alien Beast flash with just the reflector with First we tried it with no diffusion, and then what I did was I wound up taking this uh, sock from a beauty dish and just kind of finagling it onto the front of the lens. So the key light wound up being this um, at a fairly low power. It was um, an alien beast flash with a bare reflector in a sock. And then once we did that, we kind of were able to get it where we wanted as far as the shape and the concentration of the light on the face. Because again, if you look at the portrait, the, the inspiration portrait, the light is not falling off too broadly. It's pretty, pretty focused on the face. Now, the, the next thing we did, or really when we were setting up the setup, the first thing I did, I should say, was the background light. Now you see behind me here in my studio, I have another Alien Beast flash, and that became our background light. One of the things I really liked about this portrait was the sort of glow around the subject's head and the fall off outside of that. So I wanted to, I figured there was definitely some kind of um, light source back there, obviously, and it was probably um, gridded or controlled somehow. So we wound up using uh, another reflector in the flash with a, uh, 30 degree grid and the 30 degree grid kind of got it to almost exactly where we wanted it as far as the diffusion around his the back of his head and then I just moved it around a lot until I got it to where he was kind of in the right spot again I don't know what Dan Winters did for his photo, but we couldn't see it in the, in the image. And one of the problems we were having was that everything was kind of too dark with just these two lights. So the final thing we did, uh, which I don't know if you can see it in the video, maybe you can see a little bit, is we added a large white umbrella um, with no diffusion and at a very low power and, and used that as fill. 
And that, that wound up being basically what we did. We had a key light right here. We had a background light in the background. And I, this is, by the way, uh, like a medium gray artery backdrop. And then we had a um, large umbrella for fill in another light. So it was a three light setup. Now, if you look at the, at the inspiration portrait once again, the, the big thing that, that you're gonna see in there is that um, there's a, a very stark shadow across the side of the subject's face. Um, and there's also shadow on the other side of his face. Uh, so we wanted to try and create those shadows. Now, what we wound up doing for that part of the portrait was using a very low tech solution, which is just this piece of black poster board. And when it comes to flagging images, uh, I find this to be a very, very challenging part of portrait photography if you start using flags. And if you don't know what flagging is, what you're basically doing is you're purposely flagging out part of the light in your portrait. So if you don't want the entire light source hitting the subject, you use a flag. So that's basically what we did here. Now, we tried it close, we tried it far, we tried it in all different spots, and I had a lot of trouble getting it to replicate uh, what the initial image, the original image looked like, until basically what we, what we wound up doing is I put it on the, this side of the flash, and I kind of held it close and angled it sort of back and forth like this. I don't know if you can see that from here, but the light is on, I, I'm on the, on the right side of the light, and I'm angling it sort of back and forth until, and then I had my camera in my other hand as I photographed him to um, try and get the shadow where we liked it. Now, because of the hard light and the placement of the light, a little above and pointed down, we were able to get the shadow on the other side of the face very close to what it looked like and also the nose shadows. And um, so I was happy with the basic setup there. And this part, getting the flag in there, this was the last step in the process and also the hardest step. So we took a bunch of pictures and a lot of it kind of looked similar, but we couldn't really get it to where we liked it. Um, so it took a lot of experimentation. And like I said, um, John was very patient, sitting there for a long time as we figured out the lighting. Now, that's the basic setup we used. Um, and then we got it to a point where we felt like, okay, now in the editing room, we can kind of get it to the final step so that it looks a lot more like what Mr. Winter's portrait actually looks like. So let's go and I'm gonna show you now at the computer how I edited it and how we got the final result. All right, so I use Capture One to capture images and um, I wanna just kind of show you how we got there here before I show you a little bit of how I did the edit. Uh, so again, the first thing we did was figure out the background light. And I tried a number of different grids. Um, I tried like a 10 degree, a 40 degree, and we settled on the 30 degree. The other thing was kind of getting the exposure right because depend, and the distance, um, because depending on where you place it, how far, how close, uh, you're gonna get more or less fall off. And I wanted this kind of soft fall off because if you look at the photo, it's a little hard, but it's not like a, it's not like a, a, a hard vignette. It's, it's a sort of, um, sort of soft transition, maybe somewhere in the middle. And once I got that to where we liked it, the next step we did was getting John in front of the camera and started taking pictures. So again, the first modifier we used was a large, uh, well, not, I'm sorry, a 28 inch deep parabolic um, octobox. And like I said, we just felt like it was a little too flat, the lighting. It just wasn't, it didn't have the kind of drama, uh, dramatic sort of contrasty pop we wanted. So we experimented with that for a while. We tried it, this I believe was when we took the uh, diffuser off and then we tried it gridded. Uh, and I just didn't feel like we were getting it where we liked it. So eventually we removed that and then, and you can see a lot of experimenting here. This, I'm just scrolling through every photo we took. Sometimes the flash didn't pop, so that's why there's, there's some dark ones in there. And then eventually we decided on the 
harder light, which was the light we went with. And once we did that, it kind of looked more like what the original was. And the other thing we did is we, we, we had to find the angle and make sure that the angle was um, also very close because you can see he's got a hard shadow on this side of the face as well. So before I got the, um, the flag in there, what we wanted to do was make sure that the angle of the face was correct, that we had that hard shadow here and a little bit of a hard shadow under the nose. Um, and so it was, it was a matter of really getting him into that right position. And then the last thing I did was add the flag. And you're going to see how uh, the flag really is what made the, the difference. And then the other thing that was a challenge was once I got the flag in there, also getting the kind of glow around the top of his head from the background light in the right spot too. Uh, you could see here on the left, on the right side, that's the flag. That's me moving it around. And now this is obviously too dark, but once we got it sort of to this point, uh, it was looking a little bit more like the light that the original photo looked like. And that's when I, I decided, uh, let's throw in the um, large umbrella to fill it in a little bit because it was still too harsh. It was too dark. Now you can see, check it out. Here's without the fill light. Uh, and here's with the fill. So that umbrella did a, a great job of just filling in without overpowering the shadow density we wanted. And now here you can see we're getting it to almost where we wanted it. You can still see um, there's not much of a shadow there, so I was still adjusting at this point. But you can see I'm experimenting with the flag to get the shadow here. And the key light has that hard look which we wanted. Um, and then once we sort of figured out the basic setup at this point, I was confident that when I brought it into Affinity to edit it, that I'd be able to get it to the uh, result that I really wanted. And then it was a matter of getting the right expression and getting the right angle and then tweaking the exposure. Now the problem is if you go too dark, like on one of these ones, you don't have any room to uh, color grade, so you have to make sure you have enough latitude in the exposure when you want to bring it for color grading. So I wanted it to be a little bit uh, less dramatic shadow-wise than the results I wanted. And kept going until we got here. So this was the photo I used uh, that I felt like got the lighting to a point where it's very close to the original and also giving me enough room to do my color grading. You could see the flag here. That's what creates this whole shadow on the side of his face. You could see there's another shadow on this side, like on the original. And one thing I noticed afterwards is even the kind of shadow of the glasses is similar to the original. And I should have noticed that at the beginning, but I didn't until I was editing. So I thought, oh, that's cool. That's another little example um, of getting it to sort of where Dan's original portrait was. Once I got the image into Affinity Photo, uh, you're gonna see that I did much of the heavy lifting in the edits. But um, one thing I wanna be clear on is that I don't think the right way to do this kind of a portrait um, is to try and do most of it in post. There's a lot of work done in post, but you have to have the basic lighting really nailed down before you take it into your editing software. At least that's the way that I think about it. And if you look at my original image, you could see that we really worked hard to get the tones of the shadows, the contrast, the light placement, all this, all this key integral stuff about the image, we wanted to get it where it needed to be before I put it in post. Um, because then it, it not only makes it easier to do the edit, but it also makes the, you know, when you're trying to replicate someone else's photo as a sort of learning experience, I think it, it just makes the whole experience much more enjoyable. Uh, so I, I remember when I looked at the photo, I was like, all right, I could probably work with that. I wasn't too, too thrilled. Um, so one of the hard things about doing photos like this is that it's, it's tough to see what you're going to get the, the uh, final image to look like because the colors are not the same and all of that, right? Like, so here's what I did. Now look, if you take a look in Affinity, and if you don't know about Affinity, I highly recommend Affinity Photo. 
it's very inexpensive and just as robust as Photoshop. It's a wonderful program. I use it for all my editing. But you can see I use a variety of layers, curves layers, HSL layers. I used a couple of overlays from my mentor, Ivan Weiss, um, to add a little bit of texture. And then I duplicated the background a number of times, too. Uh, now, if you look, if we take all of this stuff away, we just look at the background. The, what I did in the background is I used um, tone mapping to bring out the contrast just a little bit. And I used actually two of these tone mapping layers. Here's, here's the original. And what the tone mapping did is added a little bit of contrast, a little bit of crunch to it. Uh, then I did most of the, or a good amount of the um, color grading just by using a curves layer. And what I did is I, uh, you can see kind of what I did here by pulling all the levels out a little bit. Um, and that got me that sort of cool look. Then I added these curves. I'm sorry, I added these overlays. And on each overlay, I also added its own HSL. Uh, and I took out a lot of the color from those overlays because I wanted to, these overlays are very warm, but the final image has a sort of cool look to it. And the, the strange thing about it is, yes, it's sort of cool, but it also had a little bit of a warmth to it that at least I felt. So when I did this, I wanted to keep a little bit of warmth in there, so I left a little bit of warmth in those. Then I used a, um, a lights and a darks curve, and I painted in, you could see, the highlights and the shadows just a little bit to uh, bring out the flag and bring out the shadows. And then I added a, another HSL because I was trying to get the color where I really felt like it was close. Um, and then I added another <laughs> and another. Now, I don't think, I don't know if you need to add all of these HSL layers, but I just kept eyeballing it back and forth from the original image to my final image. And I just felt like adding another HSL layer and tweaking that kind of kept the different tones separate from what I wanted to do with it. Now, the levels adjustment is just um, to bring, what I did was I brought in the, the blacks a little bit and I kind of crushed it just a little bit to get that final result. And then that is basically the image. Now I did wind up, if I remember correctly, yeah, so what I did is then I looked at it the next day and I felt like ah, it's still a little flat and a little dark. So I opened it again and I tweaked it and then I added the little black border, like the original, and I just added a um, levels layer, and I pulled up the the uh, pulled pulled it up from the right side of the histogram, so it added a little bit more bright in the brights because I felt like it was a little too flat from here. See, that's a little flat, wasn't quite there, and then I tweaked it and saved this as a JPEG, and that's basically it. I was uh, pretty happy with the results. And I really found this to be um, a fun experiment. I'm definitely gonna do this again and experiment with another one of Dan's photos that has sort of a different look. But I highly encourage you, if, if you're um, a portrait artist, a portrait photographer, and you're experimenting, you're trying to, to, to grow in this, uh, this was an awesome experiment that we did. I really had fun. It was a lot of fun to kind of solve the mystery of it. And I learned a lot from it. Um, and now the cool thing is I, when I have my next actor or even if I have a corporate client who uh, wants something different, something dramatic. And so now I have another sort of tool in my toolbox that I can use to help create cool images for people and I really enjoyed it. All right, well that's basically what I have for you today. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to gently press that like button. There is no need to smash it and definitely subscribe to the channel so you don't miss my latest video. Here's wishing you an awesome day. Go out and take some cool pictures. I'll see you next time. Peace.